Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. Welcome to this webinar called Three Steps to Master Environmental and Chemical Challenges in Your Textile Supply Chain. My name is Karen Ekberg, and I'm the manager, manager of the consulting company Leadership and Sustainability. Before I started my own company, I worked for several years at Adidas in the role of Head of Environmental Services. And before that, I have worked at other companies. Today, our focus is supply chain management, how to tackle environmental and chemical challenges in the supply chain. And I'm really pleased today to introduce you also to my guest, Jill Dumain. Since January this year, the new CEO of BlueSign. Jill will introduce herself in just a minute. Jill, please go ahead. Thank you, Karen. I'm happy to be here today and happy to be addressing you all from my new home in Switzerland. As Karen said, I joined Blue Sign Technologies in January of this year after leaving a 27 and a half year career at Patagonia. I was half my time there in product development, specifically working on fabrics, and the other half in the sustainability department. So thank you, Karen, for having me here today. It's great to have you, Jill. So, our agenda for today covers the three steps to master environmental and chemical challenges in your textile supply chain. One, analysis, two, strategy, and three, implementation, as well as an introduction to the blue sign approach and system to manage chemicals and other environmental aspects in the supply chain. We will discuss how to analyze and know your supply chain by understanding supply chain risks, opportunities, and business cases. We will explore how to build your strategy and build a program for environmental and chemical supply chain management. We will then move over to implementation and ask Jill to introduce the blue sign approach to chemicals management. After that, I will interview Jill and then you will have all the you will all have the opportunity to ask your questions to both of us. So uh, today we will cover the three steps. Know your supply chain, build your strategy, and implement. And let's start with step one, know your supply chain. What are the challenges in the supply chain? We all know that we have multiple challenges, and some of them are challenges that the sustainability experts can tackle. Some can only be tackled by the sourcing departments, and some are actually inherent in the industry, and there we need collaborative action to tackle them. We need to reach beyond tier one in the supply chain to manage environmental health and safety risks. There are many different standards. Many of them are partly overlapping, SAC, Sustainable Apparel Coalition, and their HIG index using the FEM 3.0, a tool for self-assessment and verification. ZTHC, Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals with, for example, their audit protocol. And we have BP, GSEP, Fairway Foundation, Fair Labor Association, and several others too. Many brands and retailers have a fast changing supply chain and a lack of visibility into their supply chain. Joint knowledge power isn't leveraged in working together with other brands. And we often have multiple buyers at a single supplier who all impose their programs, which lead to multiple audits at that supplier, audit fatigue, and a lack of focus on remediation. We also have a technical complexity of manufacturing, which is significant. And a joint supplier engagement platform is not available. We need to integrate several topics relevant to the supply chain. Environment, chemicals management, health and safety, labor, compliance, etc. And this is really complex to do if you don't work in a systematic manner. So you do need a strong management system. The Corporate Information Transparency Index, CITI, is a system for evaluating brands' green supply chain practices. Developed by the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, IPE, and the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. In 2016, the CITI evaluation included 198 international brands. You can see the 2016 criteria on this slide here. 
many of you who are on the webinar today are working for brands and retailers who have been scored by CITI. And my question to you is, what are you doing to improve your performance and enhance your score? Now when you manage for social aspects in the supply chain, you can apply the same approach basically to all types of factories. However, trying to manage environmental health and safety aspects will fail if you don't take into account which products you produce at a manufacturer and therefore which manufacturing processes and technical installations you have. They govern the environmental aspects and therefore the environmental impacts, risks and opportunities we have at a specific factory. If and when you seek to manage for environment, health and safety, you need to follow the manufacturing processes and understand why, how, where and when the impacts occur. This is why all standard approaches will fail if you don't put them into the hands of factory managers, verifiers, consultants or auditors who really understand the manufacturing processes and their environmental health and safety implications. That is why a simple or even a more comprehensive checklist can only do half of the job. The rest must be done by an expert, by interviewing and walking about in the factory, looking into the actual practices in the factory. But let's turn to looking at the manufacturing processes and impacts. The persons managing environmental risks and impacts in the factory must ask, what are my inputs, outputs, impacts, risks, opportunities, and what should my measures to reduce risks and impacts be? We have one example on this slide, the dyeing process. And now, let's see how this mindset can be applied to the entire set of suppliers. On the next slide here, we have applied this thinking, an understanding of the manufacturing processes and their impacts, risks and opportunities on different product groups and for different environmental aspects. The matrix you see here is a simplified summary of a more detailed materiality assessment. You can see that for every product group we have two columns, one for risks and impacts and one for opportunities. And then we have colored in the cells for all environmental aspects. Light orange means some impacts and risks, Dark orange means significant impacts and risk, etc. And this work is essential to do if you wish to build an effective supply chain management program for environment, health and safety. Because you can now prioritize and focus on what makes the biggest difference. You can use the right levers where it makes sense. Now, Let's look at a few simple steps to develop a supply chain management strategy. On the next slide, we have a few steps listed. So we build on the materiality assessment. You prioritize your supply chain according to risks and impacts, importance of the supplier, potential supply chain risks, opportunities and business cases. You align with your company's sourcing strategy and vice versa. You set goals, which suppliers, how often, which improvement goals, KPIs to follow up, analytics you may need for footprinting or reporting purposes. You evaluate the business case for your company and for your suppliers. And on the right hand side here, you can see a categorization of different business cases. We categorize the business cases into innovation and market development, brand and reputation enhancement, integrated operations, cost savings, risk minimization and compliance. And now let's move to the program side of this. So once you have your strategy defined, it's time to develop a specific program aligned with the strategy. And here are a few of the elements of such a program. There has been a lot of talk recently about equal partnerships and this is something we are committed to as well. This is really important and specifically between all players in the sector. So you, under the umbrella of an equal and fair partnership, you develop a policy and a code of conduct, you map your supply chain and we have several blog articles published about mapping the supply chain if you are interested in reading more. You engage with the suppliers and define the program together with them. 
you invest into capacity building, you develop your environmental guidelines for the perusal by your supplier of your suppliers and your internal teams, and then you can begin rolling out the program, including expectations as well as implement self-assessment, verification and audit tools. You develop a remediation guidelines and improvement program. And finally, you follow up and ensure continuous improvement. So these are a few simple steps, at least on the paper, towards a strategy and a program for environmental supply chain management. And now let's move into more detail related to chemicals management. We have listed some of the initiatives and tools available in this area. We have the SAC Sustainable Apparel Coalition's FEM 3.0, the Facilities Environmental Module, which is a tool for self-assessment and for verification uh, des designed for manufacturing facilities. And the chemical section in the FEM 3.0 is now uh, harmonized and aligned with the SETDHC. We have SETDHC, the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals program, and the several tools that they have developed. The MRSL, the Manufacturing Restricted Substances List, and its guidance document. We have wastewater guidelines. We have a chemical management systems guidance manual. We have a gateway tool, which is a database, an online database for chemicals. And there is an audit protocol as well. And further, we have Ecotex that has launched several tools, Standard 100, STEP, Made in Green. We have the German Partnership for Sustainable Textiles, where one focus area is environmental and chemicals management in the supply chain. We have Chemsec and their Subsport, which is a substitution portal. And we have BlueSign and the tools avail available from BlueSign. And with that, we have arrived at BlueSign and at Jill. And here I will ask Jill to take over. So we started as a project in the 90s. Uh, really, it grew out of a textile mill here in eastern Switzerland. And they came to realize they had a lot of knowledge from cleaning up their own industry in Switzerland that they felt that they could share with other parts of the industry and was founded as a company in 2000, so we're just about to hit our 17th birthday, hopefully getting out of adolescence soon. And the approach that was really pioneered at that time was this holistic approach to an input stream management. And we'll go into that more in detail, but that was a unique thing that BlueSign brought to the market at the time and was a, a vision of where the company began of looking at looking at the, the chemicals a little bit further back in the process. The Blue Science system does focus on people and the environment from a protection standpoint, but also the responsible use of resources. So looking at water and energy, chemical use, and we'll get into that as well. It is covering the highest levels on consumer safety. And we just celebrated our 500th system partner worldwide. So we're excited that we've hit that milestone as a company. And there's been a lot of expansion into different parts of the world in BlueSign in the last few years. And we have colleagues in all of these countries listed now that we can offer local support in local language along with local customs. And it's been a model that's actually been working quite well for us. So that's a little bit of background on who we are as a company. And now I really want to focus on what we do as a company. We work in three different segments of the supply chain, starting with the chemical companies here, represented by the beaker, moving on to textile manufacturers, represented here by the factory, and then eventually on to the brands. And we have services in each of those and cover opportunities in each, the whole supply chain, starting with brands or starting with chemical companies, depending which way you like to move up or down. This is a slide that one of our system partners, Matt Thurston at REI, created a, couple, a few years ago now, actually, as part of the Outdoor Industry Association work. And I have sort of a love-hate relationship with this slide because I think, oh my gosh, you're just trying to overwhelm people with the complexity. But then the part that I actually really like about it is it does show the complexity of what we are trying to manage in these textile value chains. And you're starting down here with the chemical suppliers, even prior to chemical suppliers, what's feeding into them, 
moving from this side of the screen over to the left side of the screen from our raw material suppliers of cotton and polymers, whatever uh, category you want to look at into dyeing and finishing, and then eventually to the retailers all the way far to the left. And when I was sitting in Patagonia as a brand, I sat somewhere in here, and we worked all the way back to about this chemical line item somewhere in here. And when I first heard about Blue Sign and what their vision was, it really struck me as I'm sitting at my desk in California with these global supply chains that I was responsible for placing business in, I was hopeful that I could maybe get back to somewhere in here. And sometimes we got back in here when we met a, a cotton farmer or we worked with a polyester company. But the ambition to come down to this level and work at the chemical suppliers here was something that was really beyond my scope. Partly we weren't an enormous company. We talked a lot with companies that were much larger than ourselves, and so we ended up having ambitions that were similar to those companies. But we didn't have the resources to deal with it. So when I heard about Blue Sign and their ability to cover the supply chain, Again, starting down here at the chemical supplier level, moving into the textile manufacturer, and then ultimately servicing me as a brand, it was something that was really attractive to me. The other component that I really appreciated and still do to this day is that Blue Sign is looking at a lot of the different components. So here's what you have coming into a textile manufacturer, and here are all the pieces that are going out of a manufacturer. So our core competency is really focusing on the chemicals, but we also are looking at what are the emissions, not only to water, which receives a lot of attention in today's world, but also in air emissions. And what is it the people in the factory and around the factories are breathing as they, as they go to their, kind of throughout their daily lives. So Blue Sign really is referred to as a system because of these reasons. So as we look at the systematic approach, starting at the chemical supplier, and this is where the company has spent a lot of time in the last 17 years, is really working at that level and understanding what are their needs, what are their challenges in the industry. And there's a tool in place that we'll talk about in a minute, but the end result is taking the chemicals at the, this is the most simple explanation I would say, Rating, and so we take the chemicals from the chemical supplier and put them into three different buckets from a rating system. Chemicals that are blue have passed all of the evaluations and they can go through and are considered a non-hazardous chemical. The black are hazardous chemicals and they're stopped and they're just not able to be used. And then there's this gray level in between that is a chemical that needs a special consideration on the way that it's handled in the manufacturing process, whether it's at the chemical supplier or at the textile supplier. And this was something, again, when I was sitting in the brand, looking back into my supply chain was something really critical for Patagonia because of the types of fabrics that we made. And I felt it was a little bit unique to the outdoor industry in Patagonia, but then you come to find out it's actually an, a pretty necessary category for a lot of areas. And the thing that struck me again about this gray level was it allowed me to make my products still with the, the assurance that the people in the manufacturing scheme were protected. And at the time, there was a lot of work being done with restricted substance lists that were protecting the end consumer that the brand is selling to but it wasn't really looking at what was used in the manufacture. So that was something really interesting to me. So when you look at our approach and what we do in each of these three categories of the supply chain, we can build this matrix of what it is we're doing overall. So for the chemical supplier, we do an assessment. We go in, we evaluate the chemicals that they submit to us that they want to put into the blue sign system. We put them through what is called the blue tool, which is checking all the environmental endpoints, the occupational health and safety, which again is really key for those people that are exposed to potentially hazardous chemicals in the supply chain. And then ultimately there's a tool that they can put in a blue sign approved product on their chemicals. So from an assessment to an evaluation and then moving on through the supply chain to the manufacturer, 
which there's another assessment done there. And one thing I neglected to say on the chemical supplier, one thing that Blue Sign does that I had that again for me was a, a really interesting component is doing an on-site evaluation. So not just looking at a desktop, to, excuse me, desktop review, but actually going on site, talking to the people, understanding their challenges, doing an audit, coming back with a roadmap for corrective action plan. So we know that the wastewater is in place. We know that air emissions are taken care of. And again, for me as a brand, that was a really big assurance that there was somebody on site at these places. So that's part of the assessment is an on site visit to the factory. And then with the manufacturer, they get what is called a blue finder that is fed from here, the blue tool. And the blue finder is basically a positive list. So when a manufacturer needs to produce something, they can go and use the blue finder as a sourcing tool. I need a detergent, I need a leveling agent, I need a dye stuff. And these are now chemicals that are listed on there that have gone through the evaluation process and are, are put into one of the three levels, blue or gray, with the blue and gray being approved for use under a blue sign system. And I'm happy to say we just hit our 9,000th chemical to be in the blue finder for use. And we have about a 50% failure rate, so 9,000 blue and gray chemicals, and we have close, a little over 17,000, I believe, total chemicals, so there's quite a few black ones that are in there. The other tool that is fairly new to the company is this X, and it's called the Blue Expert, and we'll talk about that in a minute, so I'm gonna actually leave that alone. And then they have the ability to do a Blue Sign approved fabric onto a brand. A brand also has an assessment that we offer through one of our colleagues here, Kevin Mayette, whom some of you might know. And then they have a tool called the Blue Guide, and the Blue Guide is fed by the manufacturer and it can be used as a verification tool to show that the um, manufacturer is using the blue, find, the blue finder chemicals to make it. And it can also be used as a sourcing tool if you're looking for a polyester or a nylon, who's making that for you? And then ultimately there's labeling guidelines that a brand too can label a product to the end consumer to show that they are caring and have an extra piece of validation there. So as a holistic system, you can now see that there's this ability to work up and down the supply chain in a really confident manner using the full system approach. And this is the Blue Expert, the one that I was just talking about a moment ago. And this is a fairly new tool that was introduced at the last Blue Sun conference a couple of years ago. And this is now looking at resource productivity or reducing the impacts of water, energy, chemicals, et cetera. And this is a tool meant for the textile manufacturer. It's using the machinery that they have in place. And then they're able to look at some of their footprint data, their emissions data, water data, as a result of using the Blue Expert tool. These numbers that are given here, these are benchmarks against the industry. So it was an example that we took when we ran through one of our materials through the Blue Expert to see what actually could be, how much better it was than the benchmark in the industry. So as an overview, this is the Blue Sign system from the why we do it. So we just went through what we do and now here's why. We want people to be safe, not only the consumers, but the people in the supply chain. And this is something that has really struck me since I've been at Blue Sign is, you know, we have a lot of attention placed on sewing factories and physical harm, which I don't minimize whatsoever, and that work is critical. But you don't often hear about exposure to chemicals and potentially chronic diseases that people that are working in the supply chain could be exposed to. So that's a really important component for us along the lines of the water and the air emissions, the waste that's growing out of the supply chain contamination to the soil, and then the resources that we just spoke about of energy reduction, water reduction, and then this ability to benchmark. So a mill can start to see, are they better than industry average? Are they doing worse? And how might they be able to improve? And so the whole over system is looking at reduction of impacts, the protection, resource productivity, and then risk minimization. And with that, Karen, I will hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Jill. 
Wonderful. Yes, I have a lot of questions for you, Jill, but I also want to um, uh, tell the audience that you will have the opportunity as well uh, to have your questions um, responded to. So please go ahead and send your questions via the questions function and we will uh, answer as many as possible of them in a few minutes. But Jill, now to you again. So you came in as a CEO of BlueSign just half a year ago. I know that you were well informed uh, before you joined about BlueSign, having been on the advisory board for several years. But tell me, what surprised you the most during your first months with BlueSign? I think my biggest surprise was the level of expertise that sits in the company. And I always knew that because for me, BlueSign was the place to come for expertise around chemistry in textiles. And when I was starting my journey on chemicals management in the supply chain, it was not too difficult to find information on chemistry, but it wasn't easy to find information on textile chemistry. And now we, I realize there's just literally hundreds of years of experience in the company with people who have worked in dyeing factories, that have worked in different kind of textile mills, that have worked in all sorts of chemical mills from expertise on dye stuff to leather to auxiliaries, and the deep, deep knowledge the education level as well, I'm actually not sure how many PhD chemists we have here, but quite a few, which I'm happy about because that's not my expertise, but the knowledge base, the knowledge base, it's, it's actually wide and deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You told us about the different tools you have for the different um, system partners, but I wonder, in, in a nutshell, how can a brand benefit from becoming a Blue Science system partner? So the first step is to do the brand assessment, and like I said, that's a fairly new tool that BlueSign has introduced, but what that, is, that does is it gives a pretty good breadth of, it, of its visibility to what a brand might be doing and a gap analysis. And then the ability to evaluate the risks in a supply chain, and again, based on a lot of information and a lot of experience, and Kevin Mayette, who the colleague doing that work, he spent 28 years in a brand holding all sorts of different responsibilities, so he has a lot of experience to pull on to come in and look at things from a different way. And then minimizing risk, if you're able to reduce some of these things at the beginning and source from the positive list, then you're reducing your risk of finding something as you move down the supply chain that could be problematic. The other thing, again, for me when I was working at Patagonia and working within the Blue Science system was I knew if I developed something today, in six months it wasn't going to need to be replaced. And I love that comment that came out of the green chemistry world somewhere of a regrettable substitution. And that's our goal is to avoid regrettable substitutions for the brands that are doing product development within the blue science system. Protection of the people, that's a big one. Again, we, the brands sit far away from the supply chain normally. And this is an ability to offer some protection to the people that are in the industry. And, and then also the ability for BlueSign to take responsibility of your chemical management program, which allows a brand to really focus on kind of the fun part of being a brand, of creating product and creating innovation and kind of those things. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I would like to put your system also in the context of traceability. There is a lot of talk about traceability in, in, in general in our sector today, and I wonder how can you show that a chemical is, a chemical is traced and used responsibly? So, again, having the systematic approach where the different segments are following the system, that enables us to go in at a different level. We're not perfect, there's always going to be problems and mistakes, however, there's an example from a textile mill I was at recently visiting one of our system partners, and they had something showing up in their wastewater that they, they couldn't figure out where it was coming from, and when they looked back at their chemical list, when they went back to the blue finder, they could see it shouldn't be there. So they were able to go through a process of elimination and ultimately found it was actually coming in on the gray goods into the diamond finishing plant as a as a contamination from the spinning oil 
or the knitting oil. And so then they were able to pinpoint that's where their wastewater problem was coming from with the knitting oil, go back to their knitter, request a change, and it resolved their wastewater problem. So it's, it's the ability to go back and look precisely at what is being used and what the chemicals are. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the specific case of a brand that uses an MRSL, a Manufacturing Restricted Substances list, and, se and sends it out to, to their mills, um, can you uh, respond to that MRSL with your tools? We can, and again back to avoiding a regrettable substitution, they can go and use the blue finder and go to this list of 9,000 chemicals that have been vetted and mm -hmm. approved either in the blue or the gray level and replace something that might be on the MRSL and not allowed to be used in the processing. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not easy to create or implement an MRSL, but often it's difficult to know what to do when you're faced with, a, with not being able to use something. So that's mm -hmm. where we come in with a positive list of a sourcing guideline for the system partners. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about the, um, uh, the implementation of your tools in the chemical supply chain? So, um, for example, we know that there are thousands and thousands of local chemical suppliers in many countries. And I just wonder, how do you go about that, tackling that challenge? So as in the beginning slide where I showed that we have colleagues in these different countries, that helps a lot, being able to go in and address people in a local language that they actually understand more completely what we're trying to do. And as a result of investing into these different geographic regions, we now have chemical suppliers in multiple countries and about 120 of them in total in the system. So trying to get those local chemical suppliers that the manufacturers are accustomed to buying from is really our goal. So there's mm -hmm. been a lot of effort at the chemical level in the last few years to achieve this number of it's slightly over, I think, 120 now. Mm -hmm. Good. And regarding the assessments that you do at the mills, which aspects are being assessed there? How do you conduct such an assessment? So it's looking at a variety of different areas for a textile mill. And again, back to the slide that I showed of kind of what's going in and what's going out. So we're looking at key performance indicators of specific water and energy consumption. Again, that can be benchmarks against the industry. What is the legal compliance? And not only for the local laws, but also some of the global legislation, that that's something that a manufacturer can look in our blue sign tool, which incorporates the major environmental legislation from around the globe, looking at the groundwater pollution, and then again the occupational health issues, which goes into the handling and preparation of hazardous materials. And I was even in a conversation last week with one of our employees, and he was calculating how much chemical could be in a barrel based on the exposure of somebody opening it. So it was certain amount of, of volume that could be in this barrel and still be safe. And that to me was really an impressive conversation that with one chemical at that level, the amount in one barrel. When you think of these people that don't have the advantage of, of being in trainings and a lot of education, or maybe they're on the third shift and it's 2 a.m. and they open this, those are the kind of considerations that were actually pretty interesting for me to learn about. And then eventually they get a roadmap of what are some of the issues, what are some of the things that they can work on. And again, pulling back to the expertise we have in the company, if they really get stuck, there's probably somebody here that can help them. Mm -hmm. Great. Who pays for the assessments at the mills? So each of our system partners, again, in the three categories, they're all paying for their own assessments. And I actually think that's a, a good model. And when I first started with Blue Sign, you know, or first started using Blue Sign at Patagonia, the temptation was to, to, to subsidize. But I actually really believe even more strongly now that we have to be able to work economically and bring value that is, is in line with the economics if we're going to really go across the supply chain and mm. make this 
any kind of chemical management attractive to the to textile mills all throughout the supply chain, all throughout mm -hmm. the, the level that they're working, I should say. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, but what is the business case then for the mill? So from the mill perspective, I think that some of the things that we just touched on of having a, a, somebody come in that has an audit that was developed from many, many years of expertise, getting a, a gap analysis, a roadmap of what can and can't be done, expertise to help them fulfill what that roadmap is and meet the expectations of their customers. And then I've often heard from manufacturers and textile mills that when they present something that has a blue sign certified material, when they present a certified material, the environmental conversation is just done. They can focus then on innovation, they can focus on product improvement, they can focus on all the other components that the R&D people like to do with the mill. Mm -hmm. Great. Blue sign is strong in fabrics. Into which product groups are you expanding now? Which plans do you have for the future? So it's a good question and it's a fun question to think about with my, my tenure here and figuring out what's next for Blue Sign. And it, it kind of plays into what our future strategy looks like as well. And, and I think the holistic system that we have is, is really good, but it's often somewhat difficult for people to jump in somewhere in the process. And so not only are we looking at different markets that could make sense with our tools of home textiles or fashion and we're strong in outdoor and sports at the moment, those are tools ready to go. We have some brands that are asking us about footwear. What could we do there would, which would necessitate us looking at some other components as well, obviously. And so this has been sort of my year of listening and asking questions and reaching out to trade associations, to system partners, to non-system partners, to industry groups, anybody really that I can have a conversation with to understand where has BlueSign worked, where hasn't it worked, and what are some things that we can do to the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What makes BlueSign stand out from other certifications in a nutshell? So for me, I would say the number of years of expertise that is in the company and then the second one is the on-site audits that we do deep into the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. On a completely other note, Jill, we are in a time when there, we have an urgent, urgent need for change uh, in the supply chain. There is a lot that has to be improved. And I wonder, what is your experience about change, my, change making? What creates change? <laughs> change, change, change. That's one of the hardest things, I think, for anybody anywhere. Um, I have this slide I like to use when I'm talking to people of, who wants change? Everybody raises their hand. And the next question is, who wants to change? And everybody's hand is down. <laughs> so change is hard. It's hard, no matter what way you look at it. But I think my experience is when you start with why something is important and appeal to somebody's values, and those values might be economics, those values might be clean water, those values might be protecting people, but you start to apply to those values and then align on a strategy much like you talked about at the beginning and then you can at least see how you're going to do the change and sometimes I think that makes it easier to see a roadmap of what it looks like to get to why you want to change. Mm -hmm. On a leadership note, what's your leadership style, Jill? I would say my leadership style is a little bit like a coach and thinking about a sports team or something along that line that every player has an important part and you can't have a hole anywhere in your team, but you need to let them do their jobs. You need to let them perform to their level. So I try really hard to set some boundaries, have discussions, figure out what it is, and then let them let people bounce in between and so to empower them to figure out what's the best way that they can work keep them from going beyond the guardrails, but really giving empowerment to employees to try new things. They're going to come up with a different way of doing them than me. Probably not better, probably not worse, just different. And so being open to what people have to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. 
A final question, Jill. What is your final message to the audience? Boy, I would just say that I'm so, I'm encouraged and I'm optimistic today for the, oh, I don't know, 25 years I've been doing this work specifically on environmental things in the textile supply chain. I'm optimistic of how many people are interested in this and how many people are diving deep into it. And I think there's plenty of work for everybody that wants to do this work. So my hope is that the industry continues to collaborate. There's more collaboration than there's ever been before and that we have the ability to make real change as we do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jill. Great, great to have you here. And now let's open up for the questions from our audience. And I will have a look here in our question box. Uh, Jill, if you could move to the next slide and I will have a look at the questions we have here. Sure. We have a lot of, lot of questions. Uh, let me just see here. Um, one question, uh, do the protocols you mentioned relate impacts to sites only or also to the specific products? Numerically impact per product or qualitatively as in the materiality ma matrix? Yeah, so that was related to, to my materiality assessment that I was talking about. And uh, the protocols can be expanded to also include product but they are not designed originally to be to collect a lot of quantitative data. Um, so um, more on a qualitative um, uh, level. Then, then let me see here. What more? Um, <laughs> okay, here is a question for you, Jill. Do you need the power of a huge brand like Patagonia to get auditing access to a manufacturing site or even review the list of chemicals used despite business confidentiality? So if I understand the, correct, the, comment, uh, the question correctly, if you're a smaller brand, how do you gain some of the visibility to what's happening in the supply chain? That a summary, Karen. Yeah. Do you need the yeah? Do you need the power of of a brand like Patagonia? So no, absolutely not. And I will say, when I began at Patagonia, we didn't have any power at all. And I actually had textile mills that I called to try to convince them of what I was trying to do. Say, I'm sorry, you're too small, and basically hang up on me politely, but basically hang up on me. And what I ended up doing at that point when we were a, when I was working as a smaller company trying to get these things done was to find the people that were already doing some of the work or had an inclination. So if you're a smaller brand and you want to understand, you can just ask them, are you using and do you provide any blue sign certified fabrics? Are you using any blue sign certified chemicals? That's one way. Another way is we actually do have a list of our system partners that you can go and source from them directly that you know they actually can produce a blue sign fabric. So that's an, an ability for a smaller company to start some of these changes really without spending any money. Mm -hmm. Here we have a specific question related, related to the footwear module, module uh, Jill. How is BlueSign advancing with the footwear module, still aiming to launch early 2018? We are. So we have employed a consultant this year to do a study for us to bring the pieces together. So now we're in the midst of building our strategy for 2018 and beyond, and we will look to see what we can begin with footwear early in the year and how do we expand into multiple years. Like I said, some of our expertise feeds into what footwear is doing and some of it needs to, we have work to do basically for the other components of a shoe compared to an apparel product. Mm -hmm. One question related to the collaboration between BlueSign and the SETI-HC. Is there work being done between BlueSign and the SETI-HC with respect to the SETI-HC gateway? And what is the relation between the two? So we are in dialogue with ZDHC and these conversations started well before I joined the company. And so as I've gotten up to speed and tried to understand the landscape again, because I, when I left Patagonia, I wasn't the one responsible for blue sign or chemical management. So it took me some time to sort of get up to speed with what all the pros and cons were. So 
it's not only Blue Sign's decision how we work with ZDHC, but it's also for our system partners to give us input and feedback. So we're just in the process of finishing some system partner days that we had this year. We've had a chemical one, two manufacturers, one manufacturer, and we're just about to have our two brand system partner days. So we're pulling all this together. We're in constant dialogue with ZDHC to try to figure out the best road forward. Mm -hmm. um, a question regarding the positive list. Will the use of a positive list um, the, uh, generally increase the purchase price of a product? That is, of course, the answer is it depends. But I'll tell you a story that just happened. We were visiting a, a brand that is not yet a system partner recently, and I knew some people there, so that was one of my listening exercises from a non-system partner. And we were sharing with them the list of our textile mills that have already been part of the Blue Sign system. And they immediately went to look, are any of our mills on here? Can we look at them? And one of their largest programs they came to find out a couple of days later was a Blue Sign approved fabric. And they didn't know it. And the benefit that I saw from that was all of their business negotiations happened without knowing that this was a component. So it meant that they could afford it with all of their regular economic KPIs that they're looking at, of quantity, deliveries, whatever, and it wasn't a problem from a margin standpoint. So there's not a black and white answer. It always depends on what it is you're asking, kind of the situation of what you're making and how much and et cetera. But that was one example that I was really happy that a, a pretty large program Mm -hmm. It worked without them knowing it. <laughs> Another question for you, Jill. Do we need to pay as a brand a fee for being blue signed? So to be a system partner, there is a fee involved, and that's dependent on the size of the brand and the complexity of the work that's going on. And that enables a brand assessment to be done. It is allowing coming to the system partner days and the the list that we went through before, but access to the expertise, access to the learnings. But yes, there is a fee to be a brand system partner. Mm -hmm. So we talked um, uh, before about the business case um, for a mill. And uh, we have one question here. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in order to convince the dying mills to use the positive list? I think it goes back to the question of change that you know, changing supply chains is difficult. So a textile manufacturer might be using the detergent from a company nearby and they've been doing it for 20 years and it works, it works with them, they just know it. It may, or, let's just use an example that may not be a blue sign approved chemical. So to change it is hard, it's not easy. And so, but a big part of our work is chemical change management because we really see that's what needs to happen in the industry, is to use chemicals that have been vetted. So I would say that's probably one of the hardest things for the manufacturers, is to change the raw materials coming into their supply chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the best frequency for assessing the chemical usage by manufacturing factories? The frequency of? Yeah, the, the best frequency. Annual or oh okay sorry the best I didn't understand what the best yeah so they it depends on the situation again but there's a roadmap that's put in place that the manufacturer agrees to and they will see another audit in three years but there's road there's milestones that should be achieved in order to hit that three year mark but it is a, a mutually approved and agreed upon roadmap that they do sign. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. One final question. We have time for one more, and that's a, a difficult question, I think, as well. Thank you uh, for the seminar and getting to the detail. My question is around legislation. How close are we to having world environmental standards being made, as opposed to just desired by those more responsible producers? I realize there will always be people who work around the fringes of the production, but do you expect governance to act, governments to act up on the positive work that you are coordinating to get the majority to comply? <laughs> Jill. 
What's your it's take a long, on that? It's a long question. I, unfortunately, yeah. I think the answer is pretty easy. I don't think that's going to come very soon. Mm -hmm. I think trying to, one, get this to be a priority on the global platform is, yeah. is, the, big, is the number one challenge given the number of things that the, the global leaders are looking at. And then, not unlike the industry trying to agree on a social audit or an RSL or an MRSL for the last number of years, I always think there's going to be something that's a little bit different. And I, I think legislation plays a part. I do think that that moves the meter, especially around some of the big issues, maybe around greenhouse gas issues, those sort of things. But honestly, I think business has as much ability to shift things as governments do. So mm -hmm. we can all try and lobby our individual governments and, and participate in those efforts. But my experience is much more in the business world and making changes at that level than in the mm -hmm. government. And yeah. Thank you for that so input. I'm so optimistic I come <laughs> from the U.S. <laughs> Thank you for that input, Jill. We have received a lot of questions, so we haven't been able to respond to all of them, but we hope still that we have responded to some, that you are satisfied, satisfied with that. But please feel free to send your questions directly to us after this webinar. And uh, with that, I would like to move on. We will be sending you, if you could just uh, switch slide, please, Jill. We will be sending you the presentation and a link to the recording within the next few days. And it's now time to wrap up and we have some information for you. So uh, first, Jin, go ahead, please. So really, I just wanted to give a last overview of our services, of the three different areas, the tools that we're looking at. And in addition to that, we do work on consulting projects if you have a need that doesn't fit into this. And then we also have a Blue Sign Academy that's looking at learning and educational and knowledge transfer types of issues. Mm -hmm, great. And uh, briefly about leadership and sustainability. We offer a broad range of services and have a team of consultants here in Europe, but also in Asia and in the US. We are a member of SAC and a trainer as well. We recently launched a reference page on our website where some of our reference projects are published. Please feel free to go and have a look there. And um, to some of our solutions, if you could just move the slide, please. At uh, Leadership and Sustainability, we offer a broad range of services and related to the supply chain, I wish to just mention a few. We can support you with mapping of your supply chain, with developing a supply chain strategy. We can support with EH&S programs with SAC FEM 3.0 implementation and verification as well as training and set DHC implementation. And the final slide, or the next slide, please, Jill. From us, we have one workshop offer for you. You can spend one day with us and work on your supply chain strategy. If you are interested, please contact us and we can give you more details. And with that, we would like to uh, say thank you to everyone who joined this webinar. We hoped um, uh, it was valuable for you. And I also would like to thank Jill for joining us. Thank you so much, Jill. It was great to have you here. And uh, before I say, if, <laughs> and before I say a final goodbye, I wish to inform you that there will be a survey with four questions available after this webinar. We would be really grateful for your input. So thank you, Jill, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today. And goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>